Fear is a first. P Fear is a first-person action horror game developed by Monolith Stu- Fucking god damn- Fear is a first-person action horror game developed by Monolith Studios and published by Sierra Entertainment. A publisher with a storied history of quality releases and a developer working as hard as they can to destroy their own. Released in 2005 on PC and consoles shortly after, Fear was met with almost unanimous praise, and for a while spawned a number of sequels, though after the third official sequel in 2011, the series has since sputtered out. But undoubtedly, Fear left its mark on the course of first-person shooters, with its advancements in texturing, AI, and physics. It came from a time when I was less cynical about the course of the video game industry, when the release of a big-budget original IP with advertising and hype and promise behind it was exciting, when the worst thing that could happen at launch was, hey, maybe I won't like the story, or the gameplay won't be particularly fun. It's been a while since I felt that way, like I had something to look forward to. Now I just look at upcoming releases and wonder how they're going to completely turn me off to it. What common building block expected of a game can they wrench out and hold ransom? They're putting chemicals in the water! Sorry, I got excited and then I, I got a little confused about what we were talking about. Oh yeah, fear. I can tell you a thing or two about fear. About being persecuted by literal demons. I've seen their green skin. I've seen the retractable claws. Did it happen again? Fear works quickly to get you over the chore of exposition by opening in a briefing of the situation. You take control of some guy. Who's that guy? Who cares? What's his name? What's it matter, dick brain? What kind of man is he? Hey, go fuck yourself. Look, you're just some kind of guy, alright? I don't like it any more than you do, but video game writers seem to have some kind of thing against three-dimensional characters. So like a lot of other games, you're a nameless, voiceless, characterless dude. But apparently a very talented one who managed to impress the crew at Fear, or First Encounter Assault Recon. I don't know who these guys are affiliated with, if they're associated with the government, or what their jurisdiction is, but they seem to be a proper, militarized, well-funded group of specialists who investigate and fight supernatural threats. In the briefing, we are told a corporation called Armacam, or ATC, has sort of lost control of one of their science experiments, a man named Paxton Fettel, who is imbued with the ability to telepathically command an army of cloned soldiers or replicas. He also takes pleasure in cannibalizing his victims. Paxton has gone rogue and led an attack on an Armacam facility. Ideally, they'd like to get straight to Paxton to sever the link between him and his soldiers, so we don't have to sweep through a full battalion to end this. We are chosen to be point man on this mission. Though this offends Jankowski, one of your teammates, because apparently he just transferred in a week ago. Not being able to speak for ourselves, Commissioner Betters assures the team that his reflexes are totally off the charts. We won't be alone though. We are working in conjunction with special forces to take down Fettel. So like, we got fear, special forces, and reflex man. So we just track down the guy using our satellites, and we sh we we you know do it. We sh shoot him, shoot him with our guns. Well, if you think it's that simple, then you're a dummy. You're an idiot! Why do you do this to me? So right when Point Man arrives on scene, it's clear that Paxton has already laid waste to everyone there. But according to our tracker, he is still here. But there's also... Something else here. We start experiencing some strange phenomena like black clouds, electrical interference, Jankowski goes missing and starts popping up in different places speaking in ominous riddles. The tracker leads us to the roof where this supernatural bioengineered marvel of science clocks us in the Chevy Chase with a plank of wood. In our concussed daze, he assures us that everyone he's killed deserved to die and implies he's doing it in someone's name. When we come to, Fettel is gone and we get word that soldiers have moved to a nearby harbor and Delta Force is waiting for us to assess the threat before they go in guns blazing. So we hop on a helicopter and head over, where Delta Force goes in guns blazing and gets evaporated into a red mist. They are literally reduced to Halloween skeletons. This is when we're introduced to Alma, a little girl with long black hair and a red dress who just kind of evaporates either side of these warring factions. Through intel we send back to fear, we begin to piece together the connection between Alma, Fettel and a top secret military contract called Project Origin. After Alma wipes out your protection, we are cut off from communicating with either Fear or Delta, so with no instruction and an adequate amount of preface, 
we head towards Jankowski's signal. In between encounters with merciless clone soldiers, Point Man repeatedly hallucinates to varying degrees of corporeality. A visual that is routinely forced upon him is a hospital hallway filled with blood and a woman screaming. Though these visions can be malicious and even harmful, it's clear that Alma and Fettel want you to understand their motives. Though just telling us would hardly be interesting. Alma and Fettel are infrequently your enemy throughout Fear. Clone soldiers and ATC's security forces, despite being your main enemy, from a story perspective are a distraction. These guys are throwing everything they've got at you, and they're just kind of brushed aside like dust. The plot is kind of rudimentary from there on out, relying more on the game's unique atmosphere to carry your interest, and keep things exciting. I have strong feelings about this game, and sometimes it feels like it's out of obligation, because I sort of developed a relationship with this game, you know? And not just like a friend thing. I thought about it at night, and wondered about the possibilities the future held for us, and how long I could maintain its attention before I inevitably pushed it away with my own neediness, insecurity, and erotic PVC figure collection. I followed this game's production and got hyped about its release. I mean, all I knew was that it looked gorgeous, was first person, and dealt with an organization that investigated the supernatural. That's a really cheap shortcut to my heart-like aortic sac. The problem is, out of all the places I could dream the concept would go, I don't think this was one that ever crossed my mind. A lot of things I appreciate feature a force, either government regulated or privately run, that addresses the supernatural. X-Files, Fringe Division, Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense, SCP Foundation, the, the Winchesters. I think that shit is an endlessly entertaining well to draw from. This game chose to use its organization as the title of the game, encouraging me to think that this this group would play a significant role in the plot. And guess what? It didn't. There are all these framing devices for Fear's story that are so interesting to me, but the writers really wanted us to focus on the secret of Point Man's origin. But like, I don't care about this guy. Who is this guy? What's he look like? What's his voice sound like? What's he do in his spare time? Like who the fuck is this guy? And why should I care about him? Why should I care about this Japanese ghost movie girl and her ability to turn clones into puddles? It's like, can you, can you first tell me about fear? What's their deal? How long have they been around? Is this their first case? If not, what other supernatural things did they deal with? I mean, obviously someone thought it necessary to create a highly trained, armed to the teeth squad of people to address the supernatural. So what other shit do they do? Is it just us three hanging out in this guy's garage? Why am I here? Why did I sign up for this? Is it hard to get in here? Are we a secret organization? This guy seems to know about us. Do you frequently cooperate with other government organizations? Did we choose the first draft as our name? Have we fought vampires? Why aren't we more important to this story? So you're telling me none of this is important, but what is important is the history of this incredibly rude science experiment gone wrong and why I'm tangentially involved even though nobody has the ability to outright say it. Okay, it's sort of gotten the way of my enjoyment that I didn't get basic answers to shit. Things that would have appealed to what I appreciate. It just seems lazy. Why am I not responding to anyone? Why aren't we talking about any of this? You have a direct radio link to the guy that heads a group of paranormal investigators and you don't have any questions? How did you pass the training without learning a goddamn thing about any of this? It fucking frustrates me, man. <laughs> so other than that, it's kind of cool. I mean, it gets a little repetitive when Alma and Paxton keep harping on the same shit over and over again without saying anything worthwhile or expository. I do appreciate the abundance of passive-aggressive inter-office communication. You'll pick up on a few hints by listening to answering machines, and it's a plot device I really enjoy. Though mostly anything important you learn will be from the data you send back to betters. You may come across other employees, and they're... they're fucking dummies. You mean a helicopter? Can we drive instead? My car's downstairs in the parking garage. What, are you afraid of flying? Kind of. This whole thing can be whittled down to, you're a guy that's part of a team hired to stop a psychic man, you can't find this dude anywhere. Meanwhile, Samara is killing people and jumping out of shadows and someone is yelling into a megaphone. You've, you've got something to do with this. Remember all these clues for later. Then you find him and you learn about Alma and then that, that's the end. It's not this game's strong suit. And in truth, I would have also suggested this game have a minimal plot, but one that allows me to feel anything 
for my protagonist and antagonist. I love this whole business with a rogue corporation unleashing an uncontrollable supernatural force and an equally shadowy group is called in to stop it, in essence having this war raging in secret through emptied corporate buildings and abandoned subway stations, but I want to care about the people involved. That's not easy for me to say because most people are deeply unpleasant. Fear is a first person shooter, and despite being occasionally distracted by slow motion hallucinations, this is an action experience, and a pretty great one at that. It fulfills this primal desire that waits like an impatient puppeteer at the back of my subconscious. A desire to stalk through ordinary, dull corporate bullpens, spraying shotgun rounds through paperwork, computer monitors, and potted plants. Despite my mixed feelings about the plot, I love playing this game. I've revisited, I've revisited, I've revisited this, I've revisited it, revisited it, revisited it. I've played it again many times because it scratches an itch that has yet to be scratched by anything else. It's relatively by the numbers, but it's executed so comfortably that I frequently forget. 90% of this game is maneuvering through office buildings and stylishly taking out clone soldiers, all of which are amusingly programmed to try to outsmart you to mixed results. But either way, the attention to their tactics is really amusing. A lot of times you'll be alerted to their presence by overhearing their radio chatter, which changes as you progress. They'll do things like spot you more easily if you're using a flashlight, flashlight. provide blind cover fire so another can circle around and flank you, they'll knock over tables to give themselves cover and toss grenades around corners, a lot of things that are becoming standard practice nowadays but it felt very advanced at the time. You have a lot of means to protect yourself, from dual welding handguns to a gun that shoots big metal rods that nail people to walls, to a laser gun that turns soldiers into Halloween decorations. You can only hold three though, so it's probably smart to stick to a ranged, close quarters, and heavy combo. Though some are more helpful in different situations, their damage is not scaled, so the handgun can be just as effective and deadly as any of the other weapons. It's still shooting, you know, bullets that probably hurt pretty bad. And if you can get close enough, you can throw a punch, a power slide, or even a roundhouse kick that usually results in a one-hit kill. Melee feels much less like a last resort and more like a treat when you can pull it off. All of these can be enhanced and made infinitely more majestic by using your reflex ability to slow down time. Literally every game needs some variation of this ability. I can't tell you how many times I'd find like one perfect asshole that I would endlessly quick load so I could kill over and over again in different ways. I do this over and over past the point where I feel it's acceptable to keep doing it and I get to this weird introspective place where I wonder what this means. There isn't a whole lot of enemy variation, but I also feel like it didn't really need it. Aside from regular soldiers, there are stealth soldiers, heavy soldiers, guys piloting little Gundams. Each require different strategies, but mostly what you're doing is you're shooting them, so there isn't a great deal of room to be creative. The combat in this game is so entertaining that when something happens to remind me this is a horror game, it feels kind of disruptive. I get sick of being stuck in the bloody hallway memories and, and whatnot, and I just want to get back to pistol whipping dudes. Doing some extra exploring will reward you with upgrades to your health or reflex bar. You might also find some of the more scarce weaponry or specialty grenades. So while it is a highly linear game, there is an incentive to snoop around. As far as the game's horror content, it is certainly dwarfed by the combat, but its presence is pretty consistent. It's almost like they intentionally let you get to a place where you forget that you were chasing a ghost and a psychic. And then they'll throw a few jump scares your way. There are also these floating zombie creatures that appear out of portals while you're hallucinating. These always frustrated me because they just hemorrhage your ammo and then it cuts back to reality so you feel like a dummy, like a disappointment to your community. You just hate yourself, you just get real depressed and sad. It's not a good scene. I'm not an expert at talking about games like this because I'm very picky about action-oriented games. But I've always thought this one, and to some degree its expansions, 
were very fun if very mindless. Oh yeah, there was a multiplayer thing, I didn't get into it too much though. If you're dead set on experiencing the multiplayer, you won't be able to access it through the base game, as Monolith, Punkbuster, Sierra, GameSpy, and WB Games ended their involvement in keeping the game alive. But thanks to a community of fans, you can download a free copy of Fear Combat, which is just the multiplayer component. And it looks like a hot mess, but apparently people still play it, which should be a testament to how great the game works mechanically. You know, people always ask me, what are you doing outside this residence whose occupant has an active restraining order against you? And, you know, I couldn't tell you. But people also ask me, what's your favorite multiplayer game? And I usually get a lot of blank stares when I say Asterion's Labyrinth. A real life game I invented to instill fear in potential paramours. I feel like I resort to humor when I run out of things to say. Fear came out during a really exciting leap forward in video game graphics. I feel like there was a crossover at some point in the early 2000s when things like normal mapping and volumetric lighting became commonplace to hear in game coverage. If you had shit like that, your, your game probably looked really nice. In short, normal mapping refers to an illusion of sorts that makes objects and textures appear to be more realistically affected by light. Volumetric lighting was a term borrowed from cinematography that refers to beams of light and how they are affected by environments. Fear had all this stuff, and it was certainly an impressive experience at the time. But time has chipped away and diminished some of the original beauty. It's not a bad looking game as it is, but some things are a little overly smooth and rudimentary, creating this almost cartoonish visual style that I'm pretty sure was not intended. When you get into a shootout, the mess of different particle effects still look great, with sparks flying, drywall turning into dust, and shredded paperwork gently floating. Conversely, blood effects look really bad, and they sort of looked bad back in 05 too. It's really confusing that sometimes I'd shoot a guy with a shotgun and he would just kind of explode into a cloud of blood. Pretty sure that is a little exaggerated. Also, a complaint that I've had since games fucking became 3D is that environmental damage like bullet decals or bloodstains never last more than a couple seconds. Have we still not figured out a way to make that work? Is that just me? It's really bothersome because so much of my enjoyment comes out of destroying things, and especially in this game. Why implement fancy normal mapping on bullet holes if they blink out of existence after 5 seconds? I've been trying to get over that since the 90s. In short, it still looks good, if a bit simple, and adding to that, the actual places you are going to in the game are not entirely noteworthy, but that was something I enjoyed. It really made the game lean on its eerie atmosphere to make office buildings and hospitals seem really foreboding and tense. The cinematic lighting and legitimately unique soundtrack made this game's horror. I feel like without those two things, none of this would have worked. The music was composed by Nathan Grigg, who worked on most Monolith games at the time. Fierce soundtrack is so understated and subtle and keeps the game grounded in creepiness. For such an action-oriented game, the visual and musical approach to it is never one of intense excitement, it's more like a looming dread. There's lots of ghostly Middle Eastern vocalizations and little electronic flourishes. It's kind of phenomenal, and heightens a relatively simple game beyond a standard shooter. It's a constant reminder that this force is supernatural and malicious. It's a rare occasion where familiar and not typically creepy things like corporate buildings and guys with guns can dig up an unsettling atmosphere, so I can't take anything away from the uniqueness of that. There are other elements, like Alma herself, who are very much a product of their time. When this game was in production, Americans were really into remaking Asian horror films and substituting the leads with recognizable white girls. So within a space of five years or so, we got Dark Water, The Grudge, Pulse, Premonition, The Ring, Shudder, One Missed Call, Apartment 1303, Mirrors, Possession, The Uninvited, and the creators really wanted to bank on that. So Alma's look and, I don't know, method of spookiness is very much derived from Asian horror movies. And I guess it's up to you whether you still find those unsettling, but to me I saw that wave of films as a momentary fad, and that's kind of what Alma feels like. For a game with such a subtle atmosphere, this overtly creepy little girl and her flying zombies is really on the nose in a bothersome way. I think people find little girls scary because of the sort of confusion and mystery that is brought about with them unexpectedly showing up in places they probably shouldn't be. It's the out of place nature of them, but Alma doesn't look like a little girl. She looks like a ghost from a Japanese movie I've seen. One I rented from Blockbuster and have neglected to return. I really should though, I'm sure they're gonna charge me fucking late fees up the yang. 
fear, despite whatever complaints I have with the plot and the dated cultural references, is still an important game to me. It represents the dying breaths of my childhood appreciation for the mainstream game industry. Not that I was a child when this game was released, but because I felt so childishly hopeful and optimistic about gaming. I don't anymore. Sure, games will come out and I might like them, but I don't feel excited about the big picture stuff. I can find little indie gems that stir something within me, and every once in a while I'll skeptically buy into something bigger like a Zelda or whatever Bethesda's putting out, but I don't know if I trust them. Nintendo, Bethesda, both do some shady as fuck stuff, and it only seems to get worse. This is like the fuck, this is the second time I was reviewing a game. I got, sorry, I got distracted by literal depression. I like fear. I think it's ambitious and fun and infinitely replayable, but it's also rough and cheesy and has a plot that goes nowhere so hard that it's agitating. It's a little too action oriented to be effectively horrific and a little too eerie and slow to be an action adventure game. It's like a weird science experiment where the developers wanted two opposing genres and they smashed all their ideas together until this came out. This awkward mutant with a vague unfinished plot, fantastic combat, fantastic soundtrack, and an occasionally effective horror atmosphere. It's like the only game that I simultaneously love yet think of as a massive disappointment. Kind of like how my family thinks of me. Hey, I did it. I got a video out. I, did, I What are the chances, right? Uh, ooh, I don't know if I like making this a thing where I talk at the end. I just wanted to remind you to help me out on Patreon because I have no money. I'm thank thank you for you know everybody that is that is a patron. That's fucking crazy amazing. Thank you. Can you see how terrible I am without a script? Anyway, so yeah, if you want, you can help me on Patreon. You, you can subscribe to me. You can comment. You can follow me on different social media platforms that I will rarely update. I also have a second channel called Have a Mice Life that I do with somebody else. And it's a podcast about weird Disney stuff. It's super, it's super adorable and funny. I'm saying this like I didn't eat the squished donut. You <laughs> ate it too. Yeah, you took like four bites of it. What are you talking about? And no, then you I were like, the whole thing. I can't do you ate the whole thing. I I'm pretty sure think. I stepped on it again after that. <laughs> <laughs> and you ate more of it? I ate the you, other ones you, you stepped you, on you, too. You, <laughs> and on the on that channel, we'll occasionally do like Let's Play things where, where we play games. So with that, you can subscribe to that channel on YouTube. You can follow it on SoundCloud. You can... Do you subscribe on iTunes? I don't use iTunes. But you can, you can do that on iTunes and you can review it on iTunes, I think. Yeah, you should you should review it and rate it or whatever. I think it's also on Google Play. Po I should have said that we would do the podcast every Friday. That's about the most commitment I've ever done on a, like a release schedule thing. But we've been pretty good about every Friday. And that's it. Thank you.